is there a reason you guys aren't playing today? It's, it's, it's relaxed, relaxed. That's all right, we're good, we're good. Ah, perfect. Testing one, two, test. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to this third in a series of the Friends of the South Gray Museum Speakers series. Thanks to the Friends, we're back with another great author and an exceptional subject. As we begin this evening, we would like to acknowledge and formally recognize that we are meeting on the ancestral Anishinaabe traditional territory. We'd also like to acknowledge that today is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And not only that, it's the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, and we're soaking in the heat today. Once again, welcome and thank you for your support and your continued attendance. At this point, we, I just saw somebody come in and I'd like to offer our congratulations to Mr. Stuart Halliday. Stuart was the Deputy Mayor of Gray Highlands. He was the Warden of uh, Gray County. He's been on the, the chair and a member of many committees throughout our area. And this year was recognized as the Senior Citizen of the Year. So congratulations to Stuart. And keep up the good work, Stuart. We know you will. Barry Penhale, on behalf of the Friends of the South Gray Museum, has asked me to deliver this introduction to our guests this evening. It was in excess of 20 years ago when Barry and Jane Penhale first met Max Finkelstein, who at the time was a featured paddler in a major canoeing show. Relaxing with a cold beer or two led to their inquiries as to whether arrangements could be put in place so they could add Max to a growing number on the roster of prominent canoeists turned author. They were delighted when the plans fell into place and they went on to publish two exceptional canoeing books by Max, Canoeing a Continent and the second one, Paddling in the Boreal Forest. I'm delighted to say that both books are available at the book table this evening. Publishing Max's material proved to be an absolute delight and with his already high standing in the world of canoeing, the resulting books became very popular. Later, among numerous other major honors, Max was named as one of Canada's greatest living explorers, and he was named that by the Canadian Geographic Society. Barry and Jane first encountered Max through a very large photo of him posted on a wall, which was advertising Max's presence at a conference. Barry well remembers Jane saying, and I quote, we just have to publish this guy. Anyone who paddles challenging rivers with a teddy bear fastened to his canoe deserves to be in print. Tonight it is a privilege on behalf of the friends of the South Gray Museum to welcome to Gray Highlands two very special Canadians. Tonight's presentation can be compared to, as the French say, a mille feux cake, or as we say, a Napoleon. A cake of a thousand layers. Tonight, Max and Connie's most excellent road and road trip is just one of those layers. There are hundreds more adventures, and they span a lifetime. The usual biographical information about Max is as follows. Writer. Canadian Wildlife Service in Sackville, New Brunswick. Worked as head of interpretive section and creator of exhibits 
at the Canadian National Park Service in Ottawa, biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service, Canadian Encyclopedia senior interpretive writer, Canadian Heritage Rivers, Pre Pre River System, Parks Canada, communications officer, senior writer, and a park planner. Worked as a policy analyst, interpretation biologist, museum consultant, and wildlife research, including work for the British Columbia provincial government. Creator of multimedia presentations and exhibits for Canadian National Historic Parks. Organizer of wilderness expeditions, including canoe trips. Public speaker. An award-winning Canadian Recreational Canoeing Association, winner of the Canadian Recreational Canoeing Association, an award of merit for Interpretation Canada. Max received the prestige, prestigious Bill Mason Award nationally for lifetime achievement in Canadian river conservation in 2009. He was named one of Canada's top 100 living explorers in 2015 by the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, as I have mentioned. And he received the 2017 Nature Interpretation Award from the Canadian Museum of Nature for his work in bringing Canada to Canadians. He has traveled more than 25,000 kilometers by canoe throughout North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and Australia. And he's published books on his paddling adventures. In the summer of 2017, to celebrate Canada's sesquicentennial, Max organized the Four Winds Brigade. This was the largest gathering of voyageur fur trader canoes, and that was in Ottawa, and it was the biggest gathering since the fur trade era, comprised of over 300 paddlers and 25 voyageur canoes. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Dragnet TV series version of the biography. The facts, ma'am, just the facts. The superbly interesting and intriguing biography of Max and Connie spans seven decades and thousands of miles of adventures. Max's first truly memorable canoe trip was on the Thelon River, T-H-E-L-O-N. It's a river which flows from the Northwest Territories through Nunavut and into Hudson Bay. As Max himself describes it, this paddling adventure was, and I quote, life-changing for Max. Waking up one morning, his group of intrepid paddlers noticed that the river was covered in caribou hair. They paddled upriver to find where the caribou had crossed and then followed the tracks inland, climbing onto a ridge and coming upon a herd of 25,000 caribou. They actually made their way into the middle of all of these magnificent animals who gently made room for them to transverse and traverse into the middle of their herd. Since then, he has canoe, canoed the entire 1,271 miles of the Kishisippi River. I see no one has heard of that. The Kishisippi River is the Algonquin name for a river we know as the Ottawa. Kishisippi meaning the Great River. He followed the cross-continental canoe route taken by Alexander Mackenzie in, in, in 1793. I put down 1973. 1793. And of course, it was his map-making trip. And he beat Lewis and Clark in the Americas by something like 17 years in mapping a transcontinental trip. And of course, he and Connie made a most excellent road and road trip. Max retired in 2009, and as his colleagues most often called him, the river guy likes to stay busy. I quote, I've had a hard time sitting, so I might start a foundation to get a new Canadian paddling, working with the First Nations communities on paddling. Maybe paddle back from Washington to Ottawa to cement the twinning of the Ottawa and Potomac rivers. Stuff like that, end of quote. 
His son Isaac, who was only three days old as he took his first canoe ride with Connie and Max, was paddling his own kayak at three years of age and navigating swift flowing rivers like a pro a few years later. Isaac went on to become a world-class canoe and kayaker, winning many medals at international meets and regattas. And there's a story where he and Max once walked into a store in Westboro where they lived in one of the boroughs of Ottawa. Someone came in and said, aren't you that famous canoeist? And Max said, yes, I am. She said, no, I'm talking about that other guy, your son. A humbling experience and a proud experience. Max and Connie continue with their shared paddling passion. Connie, a research scientist emeritus, has done extensive work in studies such as the effect of insecticides on bird populations in the prairie provinces. A songbird biologist, she did work with the National Wildlife Research Center and the Canadian Wildlife Service, part of Environment and Climate Change Canada. She's also an enthusiastic supporter and partner in Max's projects and often participates in the planned trips. One exclusion including, included paddling one leg of a trip by canoe from Ottawa to New York City. As one American official stated when the group paddled into the majestic New York Harbor with a local guide guiding them, the American official said, you Canadians, you'll paddle anywhere. Well, we're just glad they do. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm Gray County welcome and a big hand for Max Finkelstein and Connie Downs. Who are these people, this Max and Connie? Uh, they sound very cool. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Terry. I don't think I've ever, we have ever had such an introduction. And you research facts that I have long forgotten. <laughs> so it's, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. I'm humbled in all kinds of ways to be here. I'm humbled by the display outside that Lisa put together to symbolize what the talk is all about tonight. Um, it, it's really, uh, it's quite a welcome. Thank you, everybody. Um, and just uh, one of the things, projects I'm working on now is uncovering indigenous portages and trails. And we're starting in Ottawa, Eastern Ontario, uh, Western Quebec. And uh, it's kind of, it's a very, it's stripping back what history, recent history has covered to find out what was there before. And this is what everybody, almost everybody forgets because, you know, history in Canada usually starts with the building of the Rideau Canal or the arrival of, you know, Samuel de Champlain and things like that. But there is 8,000 years or more of history that came before that. And it's all leads back to reconciliation, which you said that uh, we're on unceded territory, but it's not that we are on unceded territory, it's what are we going to do about that as newcomers to this continent? And that's in the spirit of reconciliation. And I can say the, the project that I'm working on with a lot of other people who are working much harder than me, uncovering ancient portages and ancient trails, um, is part of that reconciliation process, recognizing that we are really newcomers here and you know an awful lot came before that has been unrecognized and it is time to recognize it. Uh, that's why we make this um, dedication that we're on unceded territory. It's that acknowledgement but what are we going to do about it to make things a little more just because you know just to balance those that little pendulum of justice. Um, but that's, uh, that's very um, off topic. So. Uh, so, so usually we talk about, uh, usually when I go make a presentation, I'm talking about some canoe trip. And uh, usually it's pretty far away from southern Ontario. And usually we don't talk about how we got to the start of the canoe trip. You talk about 
the canoe trip, and there's the beginning of the trip, there's the end of the trip, everybody survived. But in this time, we're talking about not the canoe trips, because there were a couple of pretty challenging and interesting canoe trips involved in this trip, but we're talking about how we got to the canoe trip. How, how did we get to the start, and that's the story, not the canoe trip. So this is kind of unique for me, and I will also acknowledge that this is the first time I've given this presentation, so I'm kind of making it up as we go along. So you can you know, turn me in any direction you want with a question here or there, and who knows where it'll go. We bought this trailer, we bought the car, because we needed a car to pull the trailer, and we thought it would be cool because we were both retired and COVID was over to do a long trip anchored by a couple of canoe trips in the Yukon. We had not driven this trailer before this picture was taken. This was our very first trip with the trailer. And people thought, is this your first trip? You haven't taken it out for a weekend or anything? No, no, everything will be fine. So off we went, you know, 7,000 miles or kilometers. I guess it's more like 7,000 kilometers up across from Ottawa to Whitehorse in the Yukon. We call her trailer Yuri. There is a Yuri in the audience, I know. It's not named after you. <laughs> And this is our home in Ottawa, and away we go, and next slide. Okay, so here's our route. Okay, so as you got from Terry's introduction, and, and what you didn't get. So the first time I went across Canada, I took the train. I was 18 years old, I bought a ticket for $48, and that took me from Ottawa to Vancouver. And then I took the ferry to Vancouver Island and I spent a summer on the island. And that was kind of a life-changing event. Seeing Canada from the train totally opened my eyes. I had never been west of Toronto at 18. You know, so total eye-opener. That was good. Then, as Terry said, back in 1997-98, I paddled, I paddled across Canada from Ottawa. And uh, that, that was an eye-opener, and it cost a lot more than $48. But it was fun. And so now, but I've never driven across Canada. Connie has. She's much more traveled in many ways than I am. And so this was going to be another eye-opener for us, and off we went. So you can see there's a few major stops there. We had a, we were meeting people in Whitehorse on what, July 10th or 11th or something. So we had like six weeks to make this trip. So a good amount of time. Not nearly long enough, but still a good amount of time. I put in little snippets from Canadian songwriters um, because Canadian songwriters like Joni Mitchell and Gordon Lightfoot have also been a huge, huge influence in my life. Um, so that's the route, and uh, let's go on to the next slide. Trailer life. Okay, anybody here own a trailer like this? Oh, a couple of trailer people. So this is a 1979 Trillium trailer. Um, nothing much works in it, but it rolls, and it's a box, and it's, so we called it glamping. You know, this is great. You just stop, and you got a nice dry place to sleep. Um, you've got a water tank with a pump, so you've got running water, and you've got a gas stove inside. Um, th this is really comfortable, and it was a great sense of freedom and independence. And everything is within one step. You know, I can serve Connie her coffee, because the stove is here, coffee's ready, here's your coffee. It's perfect. <laughs> A nice little table that stays there all the time. If you don't forget to take it down before you leave, it falls down. <laughs> you have to, there's a lot of shaking going on in the trailer. And, or you could eat outside. So I was a little, I'm very restless. I'm a very restless person. I don't like driving. I don't like road trips. Um, I wasn't sure how I'd fare, but I thought, well, how bad can it be? And uh, we found this was just the nicest way to travel. I re we really enjoyed it. Um, mostly because 
um, like when you, when you car camp and you have a little tent, you've probably experienced this. I remember we were in Florida car camping and canoeing. And when you're in a, you know, you pull into a KOA campsite and you put your little pup tent in between two 65 foot RVs and you feel a bit silly <laughs> somehow. <laughs> so this was great because you're totally independent. We don't need a campsite. You can just camp pretty well anywhere. And this is what we found. Oh, next slide, that's the wave. Yeah, there's uh, all kinds of people driving across the country on their own individual, very adventurous adventures. And one of the first people we met quite soon was a couple from France who had shipped their recreational vehicle to Canada and were driving to South America. They'd taken a year off work, but they were gonna make a little detour to Alaska. Like, Wow, that's quite a trip. Anyhow, they were very savvy. They've done this kind of thing before, and they told us about all these free camping apps that you can use on your phone, and that just opened a whole world of where do you stop and camp. You don't need a, a provincial park or a KOA campsite. No, there's all these free camping places, and they're much nicer. So once that world opened up, we, we ended up in the most beautiful campsites, usually by yourself, sometimes with one or two other people. And again, that gave you this sort of sense of freedom and independence. As you say, we never looked back. So, you know, when, you know this is a, a boondocking, that's what they call it on the app, boondocking. They also call it wild camping uh, over in England. Anyhow, you know, shore of Lake Superior. Uh, just a little road that went down to the lake and you're by yourself. Just, and you launch the canoe and go for a paddle in the evening. It's just, uh, it just really wonderful and just a great way to really see the country, like really see the country. Because one of our stops, and you don't remember the map, but one of the stops is Lake Superior. And I've seen Lake Superior from a canoe several times, part of, well, from crossing Canada, but I'd also done some long trips on Lake Superior before that. And Lake Superior, well, Alexander Mackenzie said that Lake Superior was the most beautiful lake in the world, and he saw a lot of lakes, and I agree with him. It is the most beautiful lake in the world, and, and it's, it's, it's a composite of a thousand lakes rolled into one. Anywhere, you know, it's different all the time, but every part of it is beautiful. And uh, so we spent, it's hard to leave Lake Superior. We weren't doing a long, we, we camped in, well, let's go to the next picture. Is he up there? He is. It has the world's clearest water. Not the world's clearest, but it's so clear. You feel you can reach down and, and touch the bottom, but the bottom is like 15 feet away. And it's covered with, you know, Canadian Shield rocks, at least in the first part of the lake. Other parts, you can look down and you can see amethysts and agates on the bottom. And it's just, just looking, it's like being, it's like flying. It's like you're flying over the landscape, paddling in Lake Superior on a calm day. And it usually is calm, at least part of the day. And the other thing, I love about Lake Superior is you paddle along the coast and you don't have to paddle very far, you will find a river coming into the lake. And you don't have to paddle very far up this river where you'll come to a really beautiful, unnamed and seemingly undiscovered, but I mean, you're certainly not the first, but you're the only person there at the time, waterfall. And you say, well, it's the most beautiful waterfall I've ever seen, except for the next one, because either going up the same river or the next river. Well, there's, that's the same one going farther up that river. I don't even know the name of the river. It, it may, you know, it must have a name, but it's just one of thousands of small rivers tumbling into Lake Superior. And the indigenous presence there, of course, Agawa Rock, Pictograss, which you can paddle to from Lake Superior Provincial Park. Not a very long paddle at all. Um, these are probably the most 
visited pictographs in Canada. They're, it's a beautiful indigenous art gallery. Uh, these symbols, I guess I can call them symbols, are repeated all across the country. Uh, I've seen the same symbols or very similar symbols all the way out into northern Saskatchewan. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, it's a little bit of a close-up. Mizapazu, the water lynx. Supposedly, Mizapazu, when he lashed his tail, that created the waves and storms on Lake Superior. We, we do bring tobacco and make offerings uh, there. It's a good idea if you're paddling on Lake Superior to make offerings to whatever gods are controlling the weather. Um, it's, uh, but those pictographs are, they're thought to be over a thousand years old. Um, when you look at a lot of rock faces that are more accessible, there's one near Ottawa uh, called Wuzzo Rock, and it's about a 500-foot rock face on the Ottawa River, and it's covered in graffiti. You know, you know, George loves Roseanne, that kind of graffiti. But if you look behind the graffiti, you can see pictographs on that rock. And you know that the pictographs are going to outlast the graffiti because the paint, they were made to last for a very long time. The, you know, it's not just a can of spray paint, it's red ochre mixed with the lining of the swim bladders of sturgeon and some kind of oil, we're not sure the formula, but the formula, they last a long, long, long time, which is comforting that our graffiti will, will just weather away. Oh, some idiot out there standing up in a canoe on Lake Superior. Somebody should tell him not to do that. So we do pull ourselves. Uh, we're not pulled away from Lake Superior. We're just leaving one part and traveling down the road. But uh, I just like this because we're uh, boondocking here uh, where the arrow is. Uh, that's the Trans-Canada Highway. And uh, we're looking for a place. And this wasn't on a nap. We just said, oh, look. There's an old construction site down there for building the bridge. Let's have a look. It's a, it's a great place to camp. Yeah, it's really cool. It's off the road. It's pretty quiet. Um, you know, this is a good place to stay. And then we took a little walk the next morning. Terry? Yep. And a little a trail leads to this railway bridge. Uh, which kind of makes you think about Gordon Lightfoot and it makes you think about, yeah, there was a time when the railways did not run uh, a long time, maybe, you know, when people were here, like eight or 10,000 years, and uh, it was a very fair land back then. The railways, well, you know, that's us, that's, uh, that's, our, that's our culture. We like to build railways and roads for better or for worse. Um, but just, uh, you know, you didn't know what you were going to discover at any of these little campsites. So this trail led to the railway bridge, which was a beautifully constructed bridge over the Pick River. And then we went, of course, onto the railway tracks, because you can't resist. <laughs> because, hey, let's cross the bridge. <laughs> Anyhow, we're, we still haven't left Lake Superior. We're still there. we got a long way to go. but. You can't go past Sleeping Giant Provincial Park if you're going across Canada. I had visited there by canoe quite a few years ago. That's more than 20 years ago now, 25, well, 26 years ago. Um, and it is one of the most beautiful parts of Canada, I mean, one of the most beautiful parts of Lake Superior. Uh, this particular rock sculpture, which for some odd reason is called the Sea Lion Rock, but it doesn't look much like a sea lion, but maybe it did before. It's eroding quite quickly, and now it looks like an elephant, I would say. But it's a very cool rock in the, and an easy hike uh, from the end of the road. But the other thing about lakes, about Sleeping Giant, is the Sleeping Giant. And of course, there is a, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, there's the top. Sleeping Giant is a big rock formation. If you look in the distance, you can see these ridges that are sort of like the Sleeping Giant. And the Sleeping Giant um, 
was the spirit of Nana Bazoo. This is the legend, the Ojibwe legend, that he was not rock until the settlers came and started the silver mine that's just on one side of the sleeping giant, and then he turned to stone. And uh, it's a spectacular rock formation and one heck of a climb up to his nose. Uh, way harder than you think. This is probably one of the higher cliffs in Ontario, for sure. And this is where the silver mine was, Silver Islet. And Silver Islet is this very, very cool little town just outside the park. It's a bit of a cottage community, but again, you can paddle around the islands where the silver mines used to be, and you can still see the openings to the shafts. They were all mined under, underwater. And uh, they, had a, they had a mechanical problem and the mine got flooded. This was back in the late 19th century. But the store is still there. That's the store, the general store that was there when, the, when it was a working silver mine. And it's still operated as a general store today, but for tourists in the area. Um, and again, uh, you know, there's not many general stores left in Canada. The old ones, there's one in... Um, What's the town near Kingston? Sydenham. That advertises itself as the oldest general store in Canada, or in Ontario, and it's cool. And then there's one out in uh, Carcross, Yukon. And uh, we talked to the people in Carcross who actually live in Ontario, and they said, oh, when you drive back, you've got to stop at Silver Islet. They didn't know about it. They said, this is another old general store still running. They could form like a general, old general store club or something. Anyhow. Um, it's, it's fun places, and when I paddled across, I didn't stop there because when you're paddling a long ways, you're not doing too many detours. You're kind of going pretty straight lines. I thought, that looks like a cool place, but I'm heading to the point of, you know, the giant, because that was my destination and I was just going. But when you're driving with Yuri, you no, know, you can uh, meander a lot more. Right, we find it hard to leave Lake Superior because it is truly one of the treasures of Canada. But we've got to get to the Yukon, so off we go. Um, I don't want to say anything bad about anything in Canada, but you know, once you go west of Lake Superior, you might as well just keep driving for quite a ways. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, we were just looking for breakfast and uh, there wasn't any places on the highway, so we ended up in Winnipeg at this restaurant which was a very nice restaurant, but I just thought the sign was notable. As you know, Connie is an ornithologist, so there is a bit of a bird emphasis on the meanderings of this trip. So we go to Delta Marsh in Manitoba, an extremely rich, rich, rich wetland. And it is an extremely rich wetland, but it's not the same wetland that it was 100 years ago or even 30 years ago. You know, so many changes that they're subtle. It's a rich, rich wetland. It's full of birds, but there's a dam on the North Saskatchewan River that has changed the flooding regime. The vegetation has changed. Carp have been introduced accidentally. They're eating all the aquatic vegetation. Um, it's a lot of changes, a lot of changes. but. To the eye, it's a, it's a beautiful place. Um, but there's a lot of changes and it's not the biodiverse place it once was. But as I said, it's a beautiful place and it's still full of birds. And then you can't miss this. Everybody knows Maxwell Smart, right? You know. That's the second biggest banana I've ever seen, 99. <laughs> okay, we went to Melita because it is a kind of a world famous bird watching area for prairie birds, grassland birds. And they've got a banana. <laughs> they've got a really big banana. I don't understand how the town council, any of you people on town council for here should take note of this that uh, when they decided to make a really large banana to symbolize why people should come to Melita, 
They could have gotten coffee, maybe, like Melita, coffee filters. But no, they went with the banana. Um, I don't know why. Oh, because it was a banana belt, says Connie, because it's warm. But that's a pretty, it's not that warm. <laughs> Anyhow, it was pretty good for birds, though. So we meander our way on to Saskatchewan. You talk to people who drive across Canada, it even is in some of the songs. Uh, I think there's a little quote in another slide. Uh, oh, Saskatchewan is the most boring province in Canada. Just straight Trans-Canada. I'd have to say, no, no, Southern Saskatchewan is the most fascinating province in Canada. You just have to leave the highway, and not very far off the highway. Um, and just the expanse of wheat fields, the canola fields, um, oh, some of the other seed crops, they're, they're, just the fields are so beautiful. The agricultural lands, the, the grain elevators, the little prairie towns. I just find it all just, just, just so beautiful. So much is disappearing of that lifestyle. But you got to get off the Trans-Canada and get on those red dirt prairie back roads. And of course, the main reason when you're with an ornithologist is to see the uh, shorebirds and waterfowl that are breeding in those prairie potholes. Whoops, oh, that's just, that's just an artistic shot of the Trans-Canada. So for the birders, and I know there's a few birders in here, um, so there's some fabulous prairie birds. I'm, I, we didn't do this, I, know, I don't have a lens that's that long, but uh, we took a few pictures of what I just think are really some spectacular prairie birds that for me are, it's quite exciting because you don't see them in Ontario. So eared greaves. Oh, anybody know the next bird? Uh, uh, the right family. Hmm? Oh, uh, no. Anyhow, it's a large shorebird called a willet. But uh, you just, you know. Hmm? It's called a willet. W-I-L-L-E-T. It's just, it's a fairly, they're, you know, about that high. A little, little not quite that high, but that high. <laughs> and on we go. It's not the birds, it's the, it's the birdscapes, like, you know, birds on barbed wire. I, I kind of like birds on barbed wire. A, that is a bared sparrow for the bird watchers in the room. Again, another grasslands bird that you won't find around here, I don't believe, no. These birds you will find around here, but I just liked them on barbed wire. And the one bird we saw, just when we were walking around town for the bird watchers here, we noticed the chimney swifts flying overhead, which are kind of like swallows, but they're not in the same family, but they eat insects and they have long pointy wings. And maybe they even nest in the church here, who know, if there's a good spot for them. Anyhow, it always makes me, makes both of us feel good when we're walking around a town, an urban area, and we see chimney swifts flying around, means there's insects to eat, means they've got a place to nest, and the world is good then. <laughs> Familiar bird for you people here, just a really pretty bird in a bush. Oh, we could get into a large discussion of the splitting of the spotted towhee and the uh, rufous-sided towhee, but hey, it's a towhee, which, which live around East, oh, it's a different species that lives in eastern Canada. It looks just the same. Once it doesn't look the same. <laughs> it looks similar. Oh, I believe one scratches with its left foot and the other scratches with its right foot. <laughs> they're very simple. Anyhow, um, they're cool birds. Super common bird, starling, but I just thought it was a kind of an interesting picture of a starling in an old shed. It's got a nest there. And that's how we knew it had a nest.
Prairie Sky is county? Oh, yes. This is a shorebird reserve, one of the very shallow alkaline lakes that are on the prairies. Quite a large lake, maybe seven or eight kilometers long, probably about a foot and a half deep. And uh, thousands of shorebirds were, you know, feeding on uh, along the shore of many, many species. But it's not so much for the shorebirds, but I thought this is just, this is the prairies, you know. Prairie skies are one of the seven wonders of Canada and one of those seven, those lists of the wonders of Canada. And I have to say prairie skies, yeah, for sure. Um, the green elevator and the birds and this, this expansive, expansive horizon. Um, you know, and again, we, it, it was a shorebird reserve. It had a little parking lot. It even had an observation tower and there's other people there just resting, looking at birds, some of them, some of them were just stopping. And as the sun set, we said, hey, let's camp here. <laughs> because we got Yuri and we can. So we did and got up in the morning and of course everything is peaceful and calm and you watch the sunrise with thousands of shorebirds. Only in Saskatchewan. Can you imagine being there today on the longest day of the year in about an hour? Oh no, two and a half hours maybe as the sun is setting? Yeah, wouldn't be a bad place to be about now. We did a lot of dodging of uh, some really serious storms on the prairies on Saskatchewan, like scary. If we had, you know, you listen to the radio and you hear where the uh, where it's being flooded, where the hailstones are fall falling, the golf sized hailstones, and you're driving, if that's where we're driving, maybe we should go somewhere else. <laughs> but you can see, and again, you can see so far that you can kind of dodge the storms a little bit, but we didn't want to get caught on those red dirt prairie back roads in a, in a tornado or a really big thunderstorm with the trailer. I don't think that would have been a good idea. And then there's this sort of nostalgic prairie lifestyle that probably didn't even last very long. You know, the grain elevators, the train tracks, the little prairie towns, and of course they're, they're disappearing. And we, in one prairie town they had not refurbished the grain elevator, but they at least stabilized it and turned it into a museum. And they the Eaton's catalog house that was built beside it. And these were like, these towns were made of Eaton's catalog homes. People ordered their homes through the catalog. They get delivered and built like prefab homes. And uh, I remember that particular museum was really not just interesting, but I had never understood. I thought a green elevator was just a great big box. But no, it's a very, very complicated architectural, <laughs> you know, structure where the grain is sorted into different um, grades and, and, and a complicated mechanical elevators on pulleys and weights and levers. And it was fascinating. And the construction, the wood, like, wow, these, these weren't going to fall down in a tornado there they were built solid it's just I had no idea so if you're ever out in the prairies stop there's several prairie grain elevator museums now where they're saving the grain elevators this one wasn't being saved in the little town of Gainesboro Saskatchewan and some of these prairie towns were a little bit depressing in a way because they're they were thriving communities that are getting smaller and smaller. But on the other hand, when you go in and have a beer and you talk to the local people and uh, uh, there's, there's uh, I don't know, it's the prairies. It's different, they're the kind of salt of the earth and I don't know, it's just, it just made you feel good and you're immediately accepted. 
you know, as, uh, hey, come over and have a beer, you know, it's kind of like Newfoundland or like Scotland or Ireland, you know, like people were really friendly, really accepting. And yes, I got offered a job right away because if anybody needs a job, just go out west and you'll get a job. And perhaps our favorite little prairie town, because this is a theme here now, we're talking about prairie towns, it was St. Victor, Saskatchewan. Beautiful little church, uh, a Métis community. And uh, with, oh, there couldn't have been more than a few hundred people living there, mostly Métis people, extremely, extremely proud of their heritage, the Red River, traveled there, there, you know, by Red River cart from somewhere else. And uh, if you go to the next picture, this fellow, whose name, sadly, I can't remember, and I did write it down, but it's disappeared. He's a Métis gentleman, and he uh, built this Red River cart. And much like we have brigades of voyageur canoes, he organized a brigade of Red River carts that traveled from, I can't remember where, but a long ways over 10 days or two weeks across the prairies with horses to St. Victor's, kind of a reenactment of how their ancestors got there. Um, it was just a very, um, it was enlightening and it was just uh, made you feel really good to see these people uh, taking a lot of pride in their heritage and seeing their heritage really recognized. And we're gonna leave the prairies eventually, but I'm just blown away by so many things, mostly in Saskatchewan. There are prairie wildflowers, and I could have a zillion pictures of prairie wildflowers, but we'll just have a few. I don't even know what that, you probably know what that flower is, Terry? Nope. nope? Oh, good. I can't remember what it is, but they're beautiful. And uh, some of the prairie insects on the prairie wildflowers are beautiful. Sorry, I don't know what that insect is, but, he, but it's beautiful. And of course, in the dry spots, you get the cactus and the prickly pear cactus are blooming. And they're beautiful. And there's other types of cactus. Oh, yeah. yeah I wouldn't want to... Uh, as, as a kid, I had them pulled up my rear end lots of times. Yeah, I wouldn't want to play rugby in a prickly pear cactus field. So we're trying to leave Saskatchewan, but we have a really hard time. But eventually, I think we do. Do we? Oh, no. We got to go to grasslands before we leave Saskatchewan. We thought we were just going straight there, but it took us so long meandering through Saskatchewan to get to Grasslands National Park, which is our favorite national park in Canada. Jeez, yes. So, there's kind of two faces of grasslands. There's the Badlands face, that's the east side. It looks like a cowboy movie. You want to be on a horse, you want a big hat, you want to be like Clint Eastwood. And then there's, the, you know, that's us, you know, pretending we're traveling through the desert. Grasslands is amazing because you can just walk out into the prairies, walk into the Badlands and just walk. No trails, no nothing, just walk. And it's just, it's just so cool. And then the Western block is pure prairie. And they're trying to bring back the natural prairie. And again, you look at it, so, well, it looks like natural prairie, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of it is introduced grasses. It's not the same grasses. Uh, Parks Canada is doing a really good job trying to recreate the natural prairie ecosystem. Again, this is a very long-term project. But a really great thing happened is they introduced bison, reintroduced bison to the park. Oh, that's probably about 10 years ago now. Maybe not quite that. So they have a herd of bison in the park. And we spent a lot of time walking trying to find the bison. And eventually we did. But they were so far away, you're not going to see a picture of them. Because uh, we didn't want to disturb them. But again, you just walk along these. It's, it's kind of like canoeing on a lake. Um, you're walking on this prairie and there's waves of grasses instead of waves of water. And there's a lot of wildlife that you do see. Prairie dogs, very cute. 
Richardson's ground squirrels, yes, kind of pesky like our uh, lake black squirrels. They're kind of pesky like black squirrels. They yell at you a lot. And yes, it took a, quite a bit of looking, but we found a horny toad. <laughs> so finally, so we got, we we're supposed to meet friends in the Yukon, so we got to get going. So we're heading into, oh, well, still in the Badlands, more Badlands. Sorry, we have to stop again because you can't bypass uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park because if there are as the list of the wonders of Canada and we got prairie skies, Dinosaur and Grasslands has, has to be on that list. Lake Superior has to be on that list. Dinosaur Provincial Park has to be on that list because um, well, it's just so cool because there's not many places you can walk around and f find fossils of the femurs of really large dinosaurs. A hadrosaur is like a duck-billed dinosaur, if you know land before time. That's, uh, who's the duck-billed guy? The swimmer? Oh, who knows land before time? Who's got kids? <laughs> Anyhow, it was a cartoon show. We watched it all the time with, with Isaac. Anyhow, it, that's that kind. He, Isaac would know. <laughs> and chunks, and just, they're just lying around. They're just there. Like, you know, the museum in Canada, there's a lot of collecting done in Badlands National, or Provincial Park back in the early 20th century by the Terrell brothers, by a lot of famous or well-known scientists. And you go into the warehouse for the museum and there are crates and crates and crates of fossils from Dinosaur Provincial Park that were collected like in 1918 and 1912 that have not even been opened. They're like gift boxes waiting to be opened. Like they don't, there's, there's hundreds of them and you know people, there's just not enough researchers to open them up and see what's inside. So. But we still got a long ways to go to the Yukon. Phew. So Connie said, okay, let's drive the Icefields Parkway. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. It's going to be so touristy. We're getting around the end of June now. I, I don't want to do that. Let, let's go by a back, you know, more of a back road. And she was insistent. Connie said, no, no, you'll like it, really. I, no, I won't. Oh, well, okay, let's go. Okay, if we're doing another wonder of Canada, well, the Icefields Parkway is a very long wonder, but it has to, and you may not agree with building a highway through the, you know, through the park. Uh, back in 1911, when those parks were established, um, there was actually a legislation that did not permit building roads. They wanted to keep them wild. That didn't last very long because of the tourism industry. So they did build this Icefields Parkway. I can't quite remember when that road was built. And it is probably the most spectacular road in the entire world. I don't know how a road could be more spectacular. Anyhow, and anywhere on this road, I mean, there's just so many places to hike off into the mountains. Yes, it can be a little crowded on the road, but you only have to walk half an hour and there's nobody and you're just walking, it's just you and the marmots and the grizzly bears. And there are so many postcards on this road, you just can't start to, you know, everywhere you stop and climb a hill, it's another postcard. Like that one. And you didn't have to stop, that was right beside the road. That was just, like I say, another roadside attraction. That was just right beside the highway. Oh look, there's a lake. Well, that's a really pretty lake. Let's stop and take a picture. Like, okay, let's turn it into a poster. <laughs> like, this is amazing. We did paddle on that lake. We did put the canoe in, we paddled up the lake, up a little river, and then we hiked up to a, I remember, to a, a spectacular waterfall. This probably took about two hours. And uh, I said, well, and looked back and said, this is an amazing place, this, this place we call Canada. There's a postcard for you. And 
the Rocky Mountains, it's a bit like being on safari in Africa. Uh, there's so much wildlife and it's so accessible. Uh, a little too accessible sometimes. So it was spring, late June is spring when you're up fairly high and the marmots were just waking up, a little sleepy so you could, they, they didn't, you know, they seemed to ignore you kind of. I think they were still waking up. That's right beside the highway because they like the highway because probably from the salt they put on the highway in the winter attracts a lot of wildlife like these guys. And this part, we camped in a campsite near Jasper. You woke up in the night in our little trailer and said, I hear something chewing. <laughs> and you look out the back window and it's an elk just chewing a branch right outside the window. And in the morning, you know, there's elk wandering through the campsite. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, but it's what happens. Guys walking their dogs, a lot of dogs tied up saying, let me at them, let me at them, I'm going to get those elk. Um, and everybody seems to get along quite well, quite well. I never thought I would see, again, it takes a long time to drive this highway because there's so much wildlife. That's, most of the wildlife is very close to the highway. Um, but when you go up in the mountains, you see other things uh, that are less visible, like the marmots, like uh, uh, weasels and stuff like that. But we finally have to get going. So we, we're now driving north. We've gone through Banff. We've gone through Jasper. We've gone through... Hinton, Alberta, where we got the oil changed in the car, and now we're heading actually up what's called the Alaska Highway. We're getting on, the Alaska Highway goes through northern Alberta, northern BC. Right now, you probably can't drive it because of the fires. I expect they're probably going to close it. And, uh, well, you know, I thought the Icefield Parkway was pretty spectacular, but the Alaska Highway has a different sense of spectacularness to it because not only is it beautiful with mountains and, and a lot of wildlife, but there's a sense of adventure now, a little more. Everybody on the Alaska Highway is on an adventure. They're doing some kind of adventure. There's a real sense of adventure. And uh, you can't help but feel that. The highway was closed for about five days when we were on it because of landslides. Uh, that just adds to the sense of adventure. So we were stuck here at this beautiful hotel as I say, I take Connie only to the best places. So uh, we thought, well, let's camp here. <laughs> this is a good spot. And uh, yeah, what, what better place to eat and have a nice supper? There was another couple there from Toronto, and they had fixed up their own RV. The guy was an electrical engineer, and he was very talented. And they were driving to Tuk to Yuk Tuk. These people, I don't think, had camped a day in their life. And they're driving to Tuk to Yuk Tuk. Like, what an adventure. That is crazy. And they probably got there. But the best thing is that, so there's the, little, there's the hotel down there. And so, well, we're stuck here. The highway's closed. So let's, let's go for a hike. Stone Mountain Provincial Park. That's where this is in BC. And, uh, well, you can just see, like, you know, the Alpine is within, you know, a five-hour hike. You're up in the Alpine, there's nobody there, and the world is yours. And how many places in the world can you do that? Yes, C Connie likes taking glacier baths. I do not. <laughs> because we don't have a shower in Yuri. So, you know, if you don't stay at a real campsite or something, it's hard to have a shower. Uh, but you can go swimming in Lake Superior. That's really, really cold. That was a glacial water. That was really cold. It's hard to have a bath in Canada. It's a one drawback. And again, driving down this highway, this Alaska highway, we felt like we're again back on safari in Africa. Because although we took a long time, a lot of walking to find bison and grasslands, 
there, they cut a strip about 100 yards wide, the highway people, to maintain the highway, to maintain visibility. I'm not sure why, to keep the forest away. So you essentially have two hay fields alongside the highway, so all the animals that like eating grass are there, and especially these bison. The bison stop the traffic because they just wander across the road, which I thought was extremely cool. Um, you know, there's a 1,500-pound or 2,000-pound animal grazing beside the highway, and it's a totally wild animal, and uh, not too perturbed that you're there, much like going on safari in the Serengeti. Uh, the lions just sit there when you pull your safari vehicle up and let you take their picture. In fact, these guys, I think, are a little wilder, or at least as wild. The same thing, I wouldn't go too far from the car, you know? You don't want them to say, I don't like your looks. It was pretty amazing. I, and I had, no, I had no expectations that this drive was going to be like this. I had no expectations of that at all. Or also along the Alaska Highway, oh, look, there's a bear. Oh, it's a grizzly bear. Well, let's stop. <laughs> let's get out of the car. I can't quite see him. I'll see if I can attract his attention so he'll stand up and we can get a better picture. <laughs> Bet you guys didn't know that. You're all going to go out and buy Kit Kat bars? Yeah. Because Watson Lake is now on the wrapper of a Kit Kat bar and this famous signpost, probably the largest collection of stolen items in Canada. And it's kind of become famous for that, but at last, we're in the Yukon at last. We're in the Yukon at last. And off we go, past Watson Lake, all the way to Whitehorse, which is not that far. That's like a one day drive, less than that. And here we are in Whitehorse, we meet a friend, uh, not by accident, this was arranged, she's going on a canoe trip with us and another friend, she's, she's there. We said, let's take you out to breakfast. I said, we'll take you to the best restaurant in Whitehorse, our trailer, parked at the nicest view overlooking Miles Canyon of the Yukon River. And it truly is quite a view. But we're not paddling the Yukon. Oh, this is the paddling interlude. So we're taking a month off driving and we're going paddling. So we paddled two rivers. We paddled the Donjak River, which is the most topmost red line. Um, it comes out of Kluane National Park, out of the glaciers. It, for, it, it merges with another river, the White, which merges with the Yukon. And then you paddle down the Yukon to Dawson City and there's a road so you can get back home. And the other river is the Tatsanshini, which you can access also by highway, the headwaters, and it goes to uh, Alaska, where you have to fly back to Whitehorse. So those were two pretty good rivers, so we did the first one, and I'm not, this is not a canoe trip slideshow, so there's not many slides, but if we go have a look. So that's what the Donjak looked like, it was really muddy, <laughs> really muddy, like you could lose your boots muddy. Uh, but still, it was very wild, very beautiful, um, very fast. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it was just a sense of wildness. Not many people paddle this river, although the Alaska Highway crosses the headwaters of it, so it's an easy... Logistically, it's easy. We just got a ride to the headwaters, throw the canoes in, paddle to Dawson City. It takes about two weeks. So logistically, it's easy. So it was, but not many people do it. It's because it's a glacial river. It's a muddy river. It's, um, you know, the hiking's not the best, but it has its own charm. Mostly the wildness. You're here, you're on your own, really. That's the kind of charm you get on the Don Jack. And that's the 
Well, that's the big Yukon where you get those big bluffs. That's down onto the Yukon River, which is a beautiful, another beautiful river. We've paddled the Yukon in other years and uh, also logistically easy because you can access it by road, you know, a few places, about three places, each place about 200 or 300 kilometers apart. So it makes for a nice canoe trip. Anyhow, and you end up in Dawson City, which is a cool little city. In fact, it was so cool. <laughs> it was so cool that we went back this winter because we said, gee, let's see Dawson in the winter. And uh, yeah, Dawson in the winter is beautiful. Like, I, it, to me, it would be my favorite time to be in Dawson. Lots of snow, uh, mountains, and it just has that sense of adventure around it. And uh, how many people, maybe 500 people live in Dawson in the winter? So it's a real tight-knit community. Then this is the other river, the Tatsunshini. So if you look at a list of rivers, you know, those 10 best river lists, the Tatsunshini is always in that list. This is like a world-class river. So this is a rafting trip. So we rented rafts. Uh, so we had uh, eight people, all arranged ahead of time. We met them after the Don Jack trip. They'd all come to Whitehorse. We had an outfitter. We rented the rafts from an outfitter, and they drive you to the headwaters. And they say, goodbye, good luck, see ya. Which I thought was, it's a quite a challenging river in some ways. But mostly, it's a beautiful and incredibly wild river. And it's a river that's part, the, uh, it's part of Kluwani National Park. It's part of a wilderness park in northern BC. It's part of a park in Alaska. And collectively, these wilderness areas are the largest protected wilderness in the entire world outside of Antarctica. Uh, it's a huge, huge wilderness area that's mostly mountains and glaciers with a few rivers in between. And there was going to be a huge, huge copper mine. Windy Craggy Mine, that's what it was called. I was trying to think of the name. Um, that was a big issue probably in about the late 80s. And they were going to build a road, um, I'm not sure where from, from whatever port you could get, across the Tatsunshini River and the mine, we crossed where the road was going to be built. In fact, where the road was going to be built is now quite a serious rapid, because I think they probably dumped a whole lot, because there's a lot of exploration going on, and they probably blew up a lot of rocks, and they fell in the river and made quite a serious rapid now. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work by a lot of people really turned the tide on that mine, which would have just opened the, that area to mining. Because once you get one mine, you get more. Once you put that investment in to build a road, um, and not and the mine, of course, it was a copper mine, uh, extremely toxic tailings. Um, it would have just changed the area dramatically. So it was nice to see that the river is still flowing, as it has for probably about eight thousand years. And it takes you. Well, and it takes you to places like that. The river takes you to places like that. The river starts kind of in the mountains, but like most rivers start in the mountains and go out of the mountains, this one starts in the mountains and just goes through range after range of mountains. And it kind of takes you deeper into the mountains rather than out of the mountains. And the glaciers get closer and closer and closer till the river is cutting through the glaciers. And that's why you can access them. Although that was quite a tough climb, Connie, to get up there. And it rained a bit. But all in all, it was a pretty amazing trip. So that's the canoeing interlude, the river interlude. We're back on the road. We got to get home. Why did we have to get home? There was a reason. We wanted to see Isaac. He was coming back from his own adventures. We wanted to be home when he was home. So we started home, but a slightly different route. If you recall, the very second slide a long, long time ago, we were coming down through BC, the purple line. Don't bother looking at the slide. Anyhow, and so we were advised by somebody we met. 
He said, where are you going? We said, well, we're driving back. And he said, we should go to Hyder, Alaska. He said, it's just a, what? Cassier Highway, yeah. We had planned to go the Cassier Highway, but a little detour off the Cassier to the coast takes you to Hyder, Alaska, and the town on the Canadian side, which is, uh -oh. Stewart, BC. It's a good thing I wrote it on the slide. <laughs> okay, we thought, this looks like a cool place. We're just driving to the town, it looked like a cool place. This was the most vertical land I've ever seen. This is fjord country. I don't think even Norway has fjords that would be as good as these fjords. They rise like 4,000 feet straight out of the ocean. Anyhow, and this town sits there, it's at the end of what they call, I think that's the Portland Canal, it's a long, long, long inlet. So it's a, it's a port, a fishing port, and also like a mining port. There's some mining going on up there. So they can bring quite large boats up there. And because there's a mine, there's a road. And so we follow the road. And the road crosses these rivers where the salmon are spawning, which is cool. Very cool to see salmon spawning. But where there's salmon, as I said, where there be salmon, there be bears. And so this is just like, I have never, I've seen a lot of grizzly bears in my travels. Most of them far away. Most of them, I just see the bum and that's good. These guys were really focused on catching salmon so you could really have a good look at them. And uh, we had a very good look at them. And uh, yeah, and it was pretty amazing. <laughs> like, I couldn't believe how amazing this is that you could, and this is not as wild, this is not a wild, we didn't just stop on the road. The, there is a viewing area that has, you know, a boardwalk and a fence that you can, you're separated from the grizzly bears, but they're right there. And uh, so as long as you don't hop the fence and become bear bait, I think you're in pretty good, pretty good position to take pictures. The bears are focused on eating salmon. Except for Connie, who can't, be trusted. <laughs> and we thought, well, that's a pretty good day. I'm really glad we went to Hyder, Alaska. Those grizzly bears were amazing. But the road goes a little farther up, the mining road, so let's drive up the road. In fact, we'll just leave the trailer and just take the car up the road. It's a Subaru, four-wheel drive, lots of clearance. We can do this. And. Uh, well, not too far off the road, and you go a little hike off the road, and these are these coastal glaciers, the Stewart Glacier, this is amazing. We thought, this is amazing. But we saw a guy with a pair of skis. And we said, where are you going? And he said, oh, I'm climbing up, and I'm going to do some glacier skiing. There's another glacier you can access farther up. So we said, well, we're going too, without the skis. And you hike farther up, and... You go through these unbelievable alpine meadows, more glaciers, and it's just like, can't believe you're here. Can't believe you're here. It was one of those places. I must be in a National Geographic special. And it wasn't even hard to get there. You know, this was fairly easy. But we do have to get home. So we go down the mountain, and we get back in our car, we drive down through BC, and we're cutting through the Rocky Mountains, and I said, Mount Robson, this is Mount Robson. It's the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies. And, you know, and I thought, okay, we're kind of going home, we're kind of starting to hurry a little bit. But even going along the highway that cuts through Mount Robson, uh, it goes along the Fraser River, and we stopped at uh, some pullover, because there's a million pullovers. You walk down a little trail to the river and there's a waterfall and there's these salmon migration happening because this is end of August and these like 30 pound salmon are trying to leap up this waterfall. I said, wow, that is really amazing. Connie has video. The video is pretty good actually. Anyhow, we've got to keep going. Here's Mount Robson. Wow, that is an amazing mountain. Let's see if we can camp in the park. But the park was full. 
but we camped on a truck pull off just down the road beside this absolutely stunning lake and this is the advantage of, have, of boondocking. All those poor suckers in the park were parked in one of those little, you know, provincial park campsites. And we had this truck stop all to ourselves and just a hundred yards away was this alpine lake that we could get up in the morning and throw the canoe in and go for a paddle, try and even catch a fish uns unsuccessfully. So we're going home. But all I have to say is we live, we are so lucky. We are the luckiest people in the world to live in this country. It's not perfect. I know it says something like that on the slide. There's a lot we can do better. And I think we're trying to do better. There's a lot that we could do much better. Some things we've done not too badly, but all in all, we are so lucky to live in this country. It's safe, it's free, and it's unbelievably beautiful. And that's about all I have to say. Well, yeah, we do have a where to next. Um, and it's not a trailer trip. We're going to uh, Peru in uh, August to paddle uh, tributary of the Amazon. Uh, so we're quite excited about this. This, this looks, they were paddling in uh, dugout canoes. And uh, yeah, we're quite excited. Oh, and then when we get, if we get home from that, um, dengue fever, you know, and things like that. Um, yes, we're planning to take Yuri the other direction and travel up the north shore of the St. Lawrence, where, where we've gone before. And it's one of our favorite places in Canada, past Tadasak, um, Natashkwan's the end of the road. And you get to Natashkwan, you can get on the coastal ferry. We can put the trailer and car on the ferry up to Blanc Sablon in Labrador and then take another very short ferry to Newfoundland, drive across Newfoundland, ferry to Nova Scotia, and drive back as a, a fall trip. I think it'll be a beautiful fall trip. So, I teach canoeing. <laughs> and uh, we, we, yeah, do bird surveys and uh, restore indigenous portages, plan canoe festivals. And we're part of the indigenous, I see your question. Restoring indigenous trails says, kind of uncovered a history of a, the Algonquin chief who was sort of the, well, he was declared grand chief, but that's a British term, not an Algonquin term. This is back in the canal building days, Philemon Wright in Ottawa, so early settle, settlement. Um, so instead of celebrating Canada Day, uh, some of Ottawa now celebrates Chief Panisi Day, which I kind of think is a nice trend. Um, Canada Day has a lot of implications for different cultures and backgrounds. Um, I like the idea of, yeah, let's have a Chief Panisi Day on Canada Day and celebrate this Algonquin chief who fought in the War of 1812 with his four sons, was instrumental in Canada remaining Canada, um, individually and with his other Algon uh, Algonquin and Native people who fought for the British against the Americans. Um, so they were very instrumental in creating the Canada as we now know it. Again, I say for better or for worse. And uh, this guy, who's quite a historical character, there will be a book, Barry. <laughs> there will be a book on Chief Pinnies. Um He's buried in Oka, which is a town down near Montreal, where has been a traditional meeting place for native people for thousands of years. And unfortunately, he's under a parking lot. So one of the things we think might be to, I don't know if you have to exhume him, but at least have some marker to that this very important, historically important person is buried here. 
Uh, so that's what I do in my spare time. What was your question? I have never loaded my canoe in a boxcar, and that's too bad, because it would be a nice thing to do. It's been loaded in a lot of things, but not in a boxcar. Right, okay. <laughs> so, um, last Saturday, we've been having an annual event for about eight years now, but there was a COVID interlude, of course, called uh, Rideau Paddle Fest, and it's to celebrate, really, paddling on the Rideau River. This is in the town of Smith Falls, about 80 kilometers south of Ottawa, the center of the Rideau Canal. It's kind of the halfway point. So we have three big Voyager canoes, we have canoe races, we have canoe tug of wars, which are quite exciting, and uh, tours, we have antique boats, local music, stuff like that. Uh, plays, even plays the local people put on to celebrate the heritage, the history of the Rideau. Because um, I, I grew up on the Rideau. I have two home rivers, what I call my home rivers. One is the Rideau and one is the Ottawa. And uh, we've paddled both of them, you know, source to mouth, because they're my home rivers. And you should, so I think, you know, you should paddle your home river from source to mouth, just because it's your home. And so that's been going on, that's one thing. When I get back to Ottawa, we have to leave tomorrow, because June is a busy month. I'm teaching uh, 16 outdoor education teachers, uh, big canoe paddling so they can be certified to take their students on trips with big canoes, mostly on the Rideau or the Ottawa. The Rideau is ideal. Um, it's safe, it's easy, um, it's beautiful, and it's historic, and there's a lot of, it's got everything going for it, kind of. And you can make it as short or as long as you want. So that happens on Friday. And so that, that's, and then we're going to Algonquin Park, but that's okay. That's our annual moose watching trip. Max, I have one other request of you. Uh, I don't know if it's changed because you've done so much paddling. Uh, since we have the pleasure of uh, publishing our two books, but you told me uh, that you wanted a photograph of yourself on paddling the Boreal Forest, and our art director said, surely he doesn't want to look that bad. He doesn't want that Yeah, yes. Northern Quebec. Yeah, so the one book, Paddling the Boreal Forest, is retracing some, some a very s small sum, of the roots of this uh, geologist and call him map maker, explorer, Albert Peter Lowe, who worked for the Geological Survey of Canada in between about 1880 and 1920. And during his younger exploration days, which went on for about 25 years, uh, he mapped most of Labrador and Northern Quebec, which at that time was as unknown as the Congo in Africa or the Amazonian rainforest. Like, nobody knew what was there. The, the native people knew what was there, but they didn't draw maps, so it was not known to the scientific community. So his job was to go map the routes uh, prospect for resources, mostly mining, They're looking at iron ore in particular, which he found. Uh, so Shefferville, he's the guy who said, there's a lot of iron ore in this place that now is called Shefferville. And so next to David Thompson, he's mapped more of Canada than any other person. But nobody knows about him. That's why we did the book. So we retraced his routes from Labrador to James Bay over one summer. And yes, it was the toughest canoe trip we've ever done. Uh, it was tougher for us than for Mr. Lowe in some ways because he had native guides and the portages were used back then because the native people were involved in the fur trade so they were doing these routes from deep, deep, deep in northern Quebec 
In fact, there's even a couple of fur trade posts. Natashkwan is kind of smack dab in the middle of northern Quebec, long gone now. Everybody's moved to communities. So the portages were, some of them I don't think had been traveled for 50 or 60 years. You know, it was very hard to find the portages and sometimes there was forest fires had gone through, trees falling down, things like that. Lots to hide them. And there was a lot of them. Northern Quebec is very bumpy with uh, lots of rapids in the rivers. In fact, you didn't follow the main rivers much. You took little lakes and lakes and lakes between and little sub-watersheds and stuff to avoid the big rapids on the big rivers. So yeah, it was a tough trip and that's why we look so haggard on the covered. That was after doing about a two mile portage that took us literally all day to go two miles as we were just kind of finding our route, you know, and little clues here, you'd find a blaze on a tree sometimes or a ax cut, uh, places where people had camped, you know, uh, posts that held up wood stoves, things like that, because people traveled in the winter in those days and the winter trails were the same as the summer trails. Um, yeah, that was the hardest canoe trip for me still, yeah. In fact, I came back with so many muscles after that trip. I looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, well, if anybody wants to buy a book, I mean, we're going to hang around for a bit. We're in no hurry, so feel free to ask us any questions. And uh, it's been a real, real, real pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting us, Barry and Jane. In 2023, Max, tell us about the trip to Concordia, the Lachine Canal, Isaac, the bicycle, oh. and the police chase. Okay, you guys got another half an hour? So, when our son Isaac started at Concordia University in Montreal, we said, well, wouldn't it be cool to paddle there, Isaac? It's just Montreal, it's not very far from Ottawa. And he said, yeah, let's paddle there. So we paddled from door to door, from the door of our house to the door of this uh, apartment he was renting with a bunch of students, which was about a five kilometers off the Lachine Canal. But we brought wheels, so we were wheeling the canoe down the street. So it was a great trip. We wheeled the canoe from our house. We got coffee at the coffee shop on the way. Uh, a reporter from the local paper, somebody phoned and said, these idiots are paddling to Montreal, took our pictures. We thought, oh, this is, this is fun. Everything went really smoothly. Two nights camping, third day we're there. It's, you know, so now he's graduating and we said, well, let's do the return trip. It's not going to be as easy because it's spring and the water's really high, but what the heck. And the Lachine Canal, I found out, is not open for water travel because of the flooding and they just got the doors of the locks open and it's just kind of gushing through. So we said, no problem. Um, there's a bike path. We'll put the canoe on wheels. It'll, I actually borrowed a rig from a friend to tow the canoe by bicycle. And we said, so we'll just tow the canoe from his apartment down to the, to the well, it's the St. Lawrence River and paddle back. Easy sneezy. So we're, uh, and Connie helped us with this because he's actually moving out of his apartment at the same time. So we drove the car down with all the canoe and all our junk, you know, that goes with the canoe, packs and tents and food and stuff. And uh, filled the car full of his apartment. And we leave in the morning and Connie leaves and she's going to meet us where the canal meets the St. Lawrence River. We stop at the Atwood, what was it? At, at Water Market for croissants and cafe au lait. Connie meets us there. It's a beautiful late spring, it's like April 29th, I guess. Beautiful day, beautiful warm spring day. And Isaac is training for a marathon, so he's running and I'm biking behind him. This is going quite quickly. Down the bike path, there's people biking and jogging and rollerblading and mums and babies and strollers. It's, uh, it's everybody's happy. We're waving to people and they're waving at us. This is cool guys, what are you doing? We're going to Ottawa, oh great. 
And at uh, one point, we're getting pretty close to the Ottawa River, and there's a road that comes quite close to the bikeway, and we hear sirens, woo, woo, woo. And there's a car going really fast, and a bunch of police cars chasing it. We said, wow, that's really cool. It's just like in a movie. And Isaac says, there's a bit of an underpass. Road goes over, so the bike path kind of goes under. And Isaac sprints ahead just because we can't see past the underpass, see what's, you know, he wants to see what's happening. It's a car chase. And he comes running back, his eyes as big as a rabbit being chased by a wolf. And says, go back, Dad, go back. And as soon as he said that, here comes the car, the getaway car, coming down the bike path. And Isaac leaps out of the way, and I'm kind of stuck. I just kind of bike to the side, but I just realize there's not room for me, a bike, and a 19-foot canoe is a big canoe. <laughs> and uh, so the car misses me, hits the canoe. The canoe gets kind of, I guess, I'm not, I'm not witnessing anything now, but Isaac is. But clearly the canoe gets stuck in the fender, gets tangled up with the car. So uh, he's going down the bike path, pulling the canoe, which is pulling the bike, and I'm on the bike, kind of <laughs> tangled up with the bike. And I'm thinking, this is not good. This is not going to end well, I don't think. I'm not sure how it's going to end. Uh, I can hear Isaac screaming, you know, to the guy, stop, stop, stop. Um, and then the car stopped for just a second. And then he reversed. And at first I thought, he's a nut. He's trying to kill me. And then I realized, no, he's trying to untangle a canoe which he did. He backed up. I got pushed back the other way. And then tires squealing. I mean, there's all sorts of crunching fiberglass, squealing tires. And he takes off and it's all quiet. And I kind of think, I think I'm okay. And I look at the canoe and Isaac's by the canoe. And I said, I think I'm okay, Isaac. How's the canoe? Can we keep going? Because I'm a bit, I think, not thinking too rationally here. <laughs> and Isaac, who's quite rational, said, Dad, it's over. <laughs> and the police are there, and there's ambulances coming, like there's a lot of police there. And uh, that canoe, the, like the wheels of the car were inside the canoe, and anything that was inside the canoe is just demolished. So, like, there's no gunnels, there's no thwarts, there's no solid oak yoke as splinters, dry bags, paddles, it's just uh, the cart is gone. Um, the, you know, anyhow, um, that, that's kind of the story. Um, yeah, so we didn't paddle back, but we're okay. The canoe's in our backyard now. And we're trying to figure out what to do about the insurance. <laughs> you know, that's still... Uh, about two weeks later, we're paddling, and Max is wearing his life jacket, and one of our friends paddles up to him and says, is that a tire track on the back of my life jacket? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Maybe I should put that on the list of damaged items. <laughs> yeah. So can we see this on YouTube? No, but you can see the first trip on YouTube, which is quite a nice little YouTube piece. It's a happy trip. So if you look up Isaac Finkelstein on YouTube, there it is. He has a little YouTube channel, and you'll see the canoe trip to Montreal. It's quite cute. He's got a, he's got a knack for video. And we were going to make another video, but alas, it's not to be. Yeah, he put the trip, like he did a little a video blog and so a friend of his was a musician and he wrote a song about um, I don't know paddling you're on your own now you know it's a cute little video it's cool. I think it's called paddling to Montreal or something like or yeah. paddling to school or something like that you know? and paddling to Carlton's pretty easy like no point really doing that just go by bike <laughs> Do I get to sit down now? Yeah, you can okay. well, stand beside me. Thank you very much, Max. The reason I mentioned that is because here's a gentleman who, with his wife, have traveled 
endless kilometers, I think it was 25,000 kilometers of canoe paddling through some of the most treacherous waters in North America and the world, and where do you almost get wiped out in the middle of civilization? So the wild is tamer in civilization. And now to thank Max and Connie, our special guest presenters, we welcome a Grey Highlander known to many of us, Cliff Cachaluba. He's now retired from teaching. He and his wife, Catherine Miller, share numerous outdoor interests as well as participation in local choirs. Many of know of Cliff's hands-on approach as a steward of our priceless Bruce Trail. Ladies and gentlemen, Cliff Cachaluba. Max and Connie, that was amazing. Um, I love uh, reading about and seeing these adventures. When Jane sent us the uh, poster, the first thing my wife twigged on to was your trailer. And, you know, just being recently retired, um, we're trying to figure a mode of transportation where we're not staying at B&Bs, we're a little more flexible, and we have a little more security, especially we're in the woods. And she said, what kind of trailer is that? And I said, I don't know. So I got this magnifying glass out, and I finally was able to read at the back there where it said a trillion trailers. So she said, I want you to start doing some research and find out where we can get one of those trailers. So anyway, um, that, was, that was absolutely, uh, that was great. Uh, originally, we're, I'm from British Columbia, so we came out in 2000, so we sort of retraced some of your steps anyway. And you were mentioning about that big banana. There's also a spot, I think, in um, Saskatchewan where they have that uh, like 10,000 pound concrete pierogi that's stuck up on a, on a pedestal too. So I think there's some competition with the, you know, with the towns and that about, you know, what can we... Yeah, absolutely. I can't remember the town, but I think it was, it was Ukrainian. I'm Ukrainian, so it was a Ukrainian spot. So, well, I'm going to put a plug in. I don't to stay up here very long, but I'm going to pl put a plug in for this book because this is how I met um, uh, Max Finkelstein was through this book, not personally. And Barry lent me the copy of it. I think I've read it three times, so Paddling the Boreal Forest. It's absolutely an amazing adventure. And that, the pictures that he was talking about, him and uh, Jim Stone, are right in the bottom corner here. And this was, well, I guess, almost 20 years ago that you did this. Is that right? 2004? 2003? Three? Yeah. Anyway, um, they are pretty buffed up, these two guys, and, uh, and absolutely knackered, you know, from when, when you start reading it. And you want to read it again, too, because it is, um, it is very autobiographical. Um, about A.P. Stone, but it's, 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 it's weaved into this adventure that's absolutely amazing. You know, I couldn't put it down. And, I, you know, like all of us, we read a lot of books and stuff, and, you know, most of them are okay, and this one's absolutely excellent. It's, it's really well written. So uh, it was hard to put down. In fact, I, I picked it up about three months ago and you know, started reading it again. It was so good. So Plus it's local, you know, just next door in Quebec, northern Quebec, the Boreal Forest. And I believe you said, I think you said in the book that the Boreal Forest was the largest track of forest in the world. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So that was pretty amazing. I didn't know that either. So anyway, so thanks, Max and Connie. That was a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Cliff. Ladies and gentlemen, it's almost time for tea and coffee, for mingling, and to acquire the books that our special guests will be pleased to autograph. Two lucky people this evening are going to win one of each of Max's books. So please get your tickets out. Steve has the door, the door, the, well, it's not a basket. The, <laughs> whatever this red thing is has all your tickets in it. And we're gonna ask Max and Connie to come up and please do the draw. And I will read the number. One of each. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Connie. 
All right, the first lucky number is upside down. The last four numbers are 3327. 3327. We have a winner there, and you get your choice of either book. So come on up. Come on up. They're right here. And we'll let Max do the presenting, and you can do the selection. And she chooses the boreal forest. Nice choice. And the last four numbers of the second door prize are 3345. 3345. 3345. Oh, a couple, accepting award on behalf of those people is Terry Mokri. Connie, come and pick another one, please. <laughs> Thank you. Last four numbers again. 3337. 3337. We have a winner right here. Tim, can you put up the Canada Day poster, please? There we are. A reminder, ladies and gentlemen, and it's right here on, it, what, oh, it's up there. The Canada Day Breakfast, presented by the Friends of the South Gray Museum, will be on July 1st from 8 to 11 a.m. at the Flesherton Kimplex. It involves and includes gluten-free gluten -free, gluten -free buttermilk waffles, berries, maple syrup, coffee, and teas. So they do invite you to join the Friends of the South Gray Museum and a special guest, Melanie Rosen, to celebrate that special day. So that's June the 1st from 8 to 11. July the 1st from 8 to 11. It's been a rough week. <laughs> also with us today, we have a special guest I'd like to take a minute to introduce. Я хочу привітати нас наш хіст з України. Тут з нами сьогодні вечір Юрій приїхав з України. From Ukraine, now in Canada, and staying with us as long as this evil thing that's happening by Russia is happening. Please welcome Yuri. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, we wish to sincerely acknowledge the support of this speaker series by the Municipality of Grey Highlands and the good folks at Ansley United Church. Additional thanks are extended to our much-valued community partners, Stevens Restaurant of Markdale and Highland Grounds of Flesherton. Please stay for some coffee and tea. Thanks to all of our friends of the South Grey Museum and, of course, Barry and Joan Jean for their continuing this speaker's series. And once again, a special tip of our hat to the man up top, Mr. Technology, Tim Riley of the Leaking Ambient Studio of Flesherton. <laughs> this marks the end of our third series of special speakers. There are plans in the work for another speaker in August, I believe, or July, the end of July, early August. And then we start up again in September. And then we start in September. So stay tuned. That is to be announced as to who, where, where we know what it is, who, why, and when. And this has indeed been another program that you should be, when it comes up, marking in your calendar. Once again, thanks go to each and every one of you for your attendance tonight. Thanks to our special guests for sharing their adventures with us. I'm Terry Mokri, I'm your MC, bidding you an adieu. Until next time, keep safe, keep well, keep above water, and keep paddling. Thank you. <laughs>